Cute Katie. Aloha, Katie. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, day three of our Hawaii Farmers Union Annual Convention. We've got Ray Archuleta here, soil scientist um, extraordinaire. You've probably seen the movie Kiss the Ground. He's here to talk more about how incredible soil is and how powerful and important it is to a viable future. I'm gonna pass things off to our organization president, Vincent Mina. Here you go, Vince. Well, aloha everybody and welcome back to our third day of our annual, 11th annual Hawaii Farmers Union United Convention. Um, I wanted to, uh, first of all, give a shout out to all of our sponsors that made this happen this year. Kamehameha Schools, big player. Jeremy Saffron, his grandmom's trust. Uh, they've been so gracious to support us the past several years, bringing this forward. Really appreciate you folks. And um, Maui County Council, the Mayor's Office, Office of Econo Economic Development, Mayor Victorino is such a big supporter of agriculture and is always involved in what we're doing. So thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ulu Pono, Jesse Cook over there, Amy Hennessy, thank you so much, you guys. You know, um, Ulu Pono plays such a big role with the local food coalition for legislature. And and is a big supporter of HFUU, so thank you very much. Mahi Pono, which you'll see today, we have a soil health initiative this afternoon, a video of our soil health initiative and how Mahi Pono has stepped up to bring land forward for that initiative to do some demonstrations. And then they also hold space for community farmlands for people to be able to get on land at $150 a year per acre with 60 cents per thousand gallons for water. It's like an amazing opportunity for our young farmers coming out of our Farm Apprentice Mentoring Program. So thank you so much, uh, Shan Satsui and Jason Watts and Darren Strand and Tiati Lawrence, all the folks over there at the Mahi Pono, really appreciate you folks. And um, National Farmers Union, of course, Rob LaRue spoke at our opening uh, the other day, which is all, which is all be uh, on our YouTube channel. It'll all be available yeah. on our YouTube channel. So check out all the videos from our annual convention since it's all going to be archived on that YouTube channel. And then, of, of course, the Department of Agriculture, which I sit on the board, our chair, Phyllis Shibabokuro Geyser, is um, a wonderful chair and spirit of bringing, holding space for all the things that we value within HFUU and bringing that forward. And Olson Trust, Ed Olson is the largest private landowner here, agriculturally here in Hawaii. And Ed's, Ed, Thank you so much. You, you show up so big for agriculture and really appreciate all that you do. You and Troy Kaila Nui over there at OK Farms. Uh, thank you so much. And um, Nellie's on the beach, or Nellie's on Maui is, is Don and Joy Nelson, uh, dear friends of ours on Maui who have, who have constantly been there for HFUU. And Joy's probably online watching this right now. The um, Down to Earth and Mana Foods, uh, Jerry Brunetti's business on the East Coast, AgriDynamics. Re Regina Marinelli, thank you, Regina, for continuing to support HFUU in, in memory of Jerry. And then all the other uh, uh, supporters, Acres USA, Gypsy Juice. We just had fresh juices this morning, all the board here. Thanks to Gyps Gypsy Juice, fresh cold pressed juices. Thank you, Emery. And uh, thank you, everybody that's out there supporting HFUU. It really you make a big difference. You, you bring us all together uh, to where we really and truly can work together in a way that uh, Zoom doesn't provide. So thank you. And uh, with that said, I want to uh, also acknowledge Senator Mike Gabbard's here in the room with us today. Aloha, Senator. Thank you for your support. And all of our chapter presidents, as you heard the applause in the background are here. Let's hear it up for you guys. Okay. <laughs> I feel like it's a telethon. Hey, you know, but it kind of is in the sense that, you know, please give generously. This is a donation only event, you know, it's a donation only event and uh, please give generously because it helps in the operations. You know, the operations money of an organization is the hardest money to get because, you know, people want tax write-offs. So it goes into our foundation, our C3, 
but you know, the C5 needs operation money. We need to be able to operate and pay the people that are doing the trench work to keep this organization afloat. So uh, thank you for all your support out there. It's, it's really important. So whatever you could give, 100,000, 200,000, we're not, we're not uh, picky, you know. But uh, at any event, uh, we have a dear friend of ours who has been so giving to the organization in, in educational outreach. Our, a brother of a different mother, Ray Archuleta, coming out of Missouri. And, you know, Ray has been such an advocate for regenerative agricultural practices. He worked with NRCS for how many years, Ray? 35 or something? 30, 30, 30 years, yeah. And, um, you know, has been uh, 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 a fellow a conspirator with Acres USA, uh, all the folks that have come through Acres. And uh, so it, it's really my pleasure to bring Ray back to the, the party. Thank you so much, Ray, for being here today. How's the weather over there? You're in Missouri, right? Uh, thank you, Vincent, for those kind words. Yeah, we just we just kind of last night we had a big tornado warning, and you've heard about what happened in the mainland that a lot of people lost their lives sadly, and we we missed it. Yeah, Kentucky. That same storm passed through Missouri, and we were very fortunate. My mother came, my mother-in-law came knocking at the door and says, "It's a tornado warning," and I and so. It was a, a frightening thing. So please think about the people that have lost their life and how important and precious life is. And so what you were talking about, Vincent, everything we do today really matters. And so the tiny little things do really matter. So thank uh, everybody for what they've done. That's your heart, Ray. So we're all ears, my brother. Okay, well, Let's uh, let me uh, start off this way. I want to say aloha, good good morning to all of you beautiful people in Hawaii. I miss Hawaii. I love Hawaii. It's one of the best things I did in my career is to come to visit Hawaii. Um, and so I'm I'm very glad to be here. I'm going to talk to you about something that, um, in fact, I'm going to share my screen, and uh, I think I can do it. And let's start off this way and get into my talk. And okay, we'll go here. Okay, can everybody see my slide? One slide only. It is Katie, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank That's you. Awesome. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate it. But okay, let's back up a little bit. Okay, today my my slide is titled Regenerative Agriculture the butterfly effect that will change the world. I believe that regenerative agriculture will be that change, a tiny little butterfly. Many of you might not have heard of the butterfly effect, but I'm gonna explain that to you in a little while. And these, so the tiny things, this tiny thing like a butterfly, has been said, can it create a tornado? And well, we'll talk about that, how little tiny things in our lives can make a huge difference that can have incredible outcomes. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed as I travel through the whole country is these are some of the common things that I find as I've been to every state from Hawaii to Puerto Rico. I've been in every state in the union, uh, but millions of miles teaching about soil health, teaching about regenerative agriculture, teaching about how to mimic nature. These are the four common things that I see that not only our educational system and myself included did not understand. One of them is that the soil is alive. I really, really did not grasp the how alive the soil. It is alive as just as you are. And until we wrap around our mind that concept, I tell farmers and ranchers, you're not gonna change your operation. The number two thing is that really has impacted me and throughout the years and I've seen what our educational systems have done, have not taught connectness and relationship. In other words, it's uh, ecology. It really is the butterfly effect on how everything is so intimately connected. Number three uh, is understanding the goal. There's nothing more frustrating in life. I can, I'll tell you, when I was working in Oregon as a district conservationist, 
and I would work all day and I'd come to my farm. And after eight years of university and agriculture, I, I'll be honest and confess to you, I didn't, I didn't know what the goal was. I, I didn't really know what the goal was in agriculture. I thought it was about production and, and growing things, but it's much more intimate than that, much more elegant. It's about mimicking nature. And we'll talk about biomimicry, mimic life. Our farms, we want to mimic life and we want to follow the principles and patterns of nature. And we're going to talk about that. And the last one, and I think extremely very powerful is commitment. I see a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge, but do not have the commitment. You can come to a conference, you can come and learn, but yet if you don't have the commitment to go do these things, to carry out the logistics, it, you're, it, it's not going to change anything on your operation. So let's start off with the butterfly effect. What is the butterfly effect? The butterfly effect goes like this. It was absolutely a butterfly effect. The concept is, can the flapping of the wings of a butterfly in South America, it's moving its wings, moving the molecules under its wings, can it create a tornado in the Midwest? The answer is yes, it can. The tiny perturbations, the tiny movements of that butterfly can have such an impact that it can create a tornado. What is that saying? It is saying that the natural system is so intimately connect, connected that everything in our life is important. The people that your spouse, the person you married, the people you went to school with all had an impact. I remember in sixth grade, if I went on to the private school versus the public school at that time, it would have made a huge, it made a huge difference. My parents sent me to that private school, facilitated the passion to go, go to school and, then, and go to uh, uh, get a four-year degree. That tiny little perturbation, that little tiny change changed my outlife, my whole life. My, the meeting of my wife changed my whole life. The coming in contact with soil health. Uh, certain people, certain books, that's that butterfly effect. And all of us have that incredible potential to do. Let's build on that concept. If you want to learn more about this, and I think this book is fantastic. I finished reading it. It's, called, and it's one of the New York Times bestseller. It's called Chaos, the New Science by James Gleick. And it talks about Eduardo Norton Lorenzo. Dr. Lorenzo was from MIT. He had a, he was a brilliant mind. He was a great meteorologist, but a great physicist and a mathematician. He was brilliant. It was he that coined the phrase the butterfly effect. And so how did he come across this concept? This and it started by accident. Some of the most awesome scientific things that we learn come from accident, really act, actual accidents. And his accident was this. He was working on his computer. And imagine that's a computer at that time. And he had 12 parameters of the weather, uh, barometric pressure, temperature, 12 parameters. And he had it crunching on that computer. And one day he had a glitch. And he had just stepped out and he noticed that something was wrong with the computer. So that when he, if you can see these decimals here that he, he put, he said, well, I'll just go ahead and put uh, these decimals to three decimals from the, from, the, from the decimal point and I'll move it just three points instead of just the normal five that the computer had done because normally he had the computer all the way down to the five or six digits. So he said, well, a couple of digits, two or three decimals will not make a, a point. It won't make a difference. That nuances of the thousands it won't make a difference. But to his discovery, it made a huge difference. That thousands of a difference in the measurements determine whether you were going to get rain or were you going to get sunshine. That little change made that huge difference whether the model would read either rain 
or son. Dr. Lorenzo came to the conclusion, and this is where the concept of the butterfly effect came, that these tiny things, that their natural system, these tiny changes in that whole system can make a huge impact. He came and he made this uh, point that if you took the most sophisticated measurement of all the planet, and if you would separate these pieces of equipment a foot apart throughout the globe, all the way up to the atmosphere, all the way on the surface, and you would use supercomputers and you would get the best measurements and take away from the air, you would still not be able to predict the weather. That's how alive the weather is, how incredible dynamic and how it changes. That's why scientists, when they use sophisticated satellite imagery, most of the time, they a lot of the times consistently, they have to do, they have to do five or 10 measurements, run models. As you can see in the back here, they'll run several models of predictions because they cannot predict it. In fact, you're better off after eight days, not even looking at the weather. One or two days is pretty close after the third day, but after eight days, the weather is useless. The prediction is wrong. So what's the point here? The point is the little things matter. One little tiny change can change the whole outcome, especially in dynamic living ecosystems. And we are dynamic living systems ourselves. Again, they know about this concept for a long time. It's called the sensi sensitivity dependence of the initial condition. The initial condition of any system can change the total outcome. Let me give you an example. This was an old um, uh, adage way back, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and it went like this. And you can see that chaos and existed a long time ago, and people knew about this. Here's how it goes. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the message was lost. For want of a message, the battle was lost. For want of the battle, the, battle, the kingdom was lost. All for the want of horse the sensitive dependence of that little nail to that horseshoe turned the outcome of whether a kingdom existed or not. What we do on our farms and our ranches, what we do in our lives, that little tiny nail can make a huge impact. The way we manage can have a significant outcome financially, ecologically, and even impact the community. Why did it take so long for this knowledge, for this wisdom of this, this type of science to come out? Folks, I was a product, and many of us that have gone to Western schools were a product of reductionist science. For many years, this is a picture of a duck. We looked at nature very, very mechanicistic. We looked at it as a machine not realize that it's not a machine. It's a living dynamic ecosystem. Reductionist, this reduces things down to its element, but it forgets that everything is intimately connected and everything is a whole. Here's the thing that I want you to walk away with this. Nature is very deterministic, but also unpredictable. What does that mean? I can always feel very comfortable that the sun will always come up, that we'll always have rain somewhere in the globe. We will always have these ecosystem services, always a process, these always happening as life exists on this planet. But it's unpredictable. And we have to wrap our mind around that. And, and you know, right now, just kind of feel and just get to a point you cannot think like an engineer with the natural system. You have to understand it's not predictable. She's chaos. 
Chaos means mathematically unpredictable. None of you can predict whether your dog's going to bite you or not. Not 100%. That's unpredictability. You'll never know 100% on how your mate's going to respond. <laughs> she runs on chaos. All of us do. Please wrap that around your mind. Nature's deterministic, but she's also unpredictable. It's relationship. It's all about relationship. The one word I think about, especially dealing with natural systems, a relationship is ecology, a state of connectedness. I didn't realize how intimately connected all the things are on your farm and operation. If you do not understand that, you're not going to understand what kind of practice, the impact of the typical practice you're going to do. If you do a spray or if you till, how is it going to affect the interconnectedness of the web, the soil web, and all the ecology? You have to wrap your mind and understand connectedness. Let me give you a perspective. I've used these slides before, and I could tell you this is a typical concept at farmers that will display disconnectness. When I go across the country and talk about the patterns of soil health and ecological principles, first thing people say, well, Ray, this won't work here. It's too cold. It won't work here because it's too dry. It won't work here because it's too wet. You can see the disconnectness. They don't understand that all these ecosystem processes, these ecoregions have something in common. All four ecosystem processes work. The life works on all those ecoregions. Life dominates it. Yes, even in the desert, there are microbes in that desert. We're doing no-till in, in Canada. They're doing no-till in Afghanistan. They're doing it in, in the humid Georgia. What do they all have in common? Connectness, life. It's, it's more, it's deep. Everything is connected. So first thing is to understand the power of life. One of the things I did not understand for a long time and appreciate the power of life. I tell farmers, now look at that, look at that rock. How can that tree survive that? I see that very much growing up in the West and growing up in the Rockies. I, that I said, wow, how can that tree survive that compaction? How can it do that? When I talk to farmers, that is compaction. And they start to laugh. And farmers first thing is, well, let's pull out a big tillage machine, break up the compaction so it can have more air. How does that tree survive that? How does that survive that? The power that tree can re release with carbonic acids, comes in contact with water and the rock, carbonic acids, but fungi release these powerful enzymes that break rock down. Life transforms this planet. It's life. So when I want to approach my farm and operation, what would be the best way to fix a problem with life itself, with living plants and living animals? I really want to stress this 25% of the soil's biodiversity, of all biodiversity on the planet is in the soil. I tell farmers, until you realize that this water bear, this incredible creature is in the soil and the water column, this creature, this soil is alive. It reproduces, it breathes. There's a consciousness to it. It's elegant, it's beautiful. Let me show you the power of life. This is Australia, look at this. This is a, a calcium gypsum deposit. Look at this farm. How would you like to have that farm? My, rock, my farm in the Ozarks is pretty much rock. Look at that top layer, that 12 inches, 8 to 12 inches. Why is it dark? Life, the power of life. So what I'm going to share with you is that incredible observation, of how we need to start observing the power of life and how we need to look at patterns. Observation is one of the most incredible skills you can learn. Let's go down and I'll show you some more on how we're going to start 
learning the power observation. First thing is understand there are pa patterns in nature. The human body also has patterns. These, when you go to a doctor, the doctor looks at these four vital signs. There are vital signs I look at in the soil to know if it's functioning. Same thing here in the human body. When a doctor looks at you, that's why they do body temperature, pulse, blood pressure. All that tells them about function, function of your body. Same thing with the soil, and I'll talk about that. So ecosystem processes, we're gonna talk about those ecosystem processes, those patterns, those deterministic things that occur all the time and how they both and the indicators, like I was talking to you about the indicators of blood pressure. I'm gonna to talk to you about certain indicators to look at to make sure those ecosystem processes are working and functioning. This next slide will show you in the nature and properties of soils, these are some of the indicators people would look from all ethnic groups. I found it very fascinating that ethnopediology, indigenous people looked at classification system. They looked at certain things in the landscape. They observed certain things. Notice most, most ethnic groups looked at color, texture, soil moisture, organic matter. And you start seeing in the bottom and guess which one is the lowest? Soil temperature. And it's, that was fascinating. But I would argue that soil temperature, just like your human body, if you have elevated soil temperature, you will get sick. In fact, you will die. Soil temperature is absolutely critical. And we'll talk about that in a second, but notice that most ethnic groups to look at classification, to look at indicators, soil temperature was very low. I would argue that they realized that that soil was alive, absolutely alive, just like they were. Now, one thing I want us to realize, keep in mind, your human body is self-regulating, self-healing, self-organizing. The soil works the same way. I tell people, you wanna know how the soil works? Look at your body. It's self-regulating, self-healing, self-organizing. It stops to self-regulate. There's no self-healing, self-organizing. It's called death sickness. Same thing with the human body, same thing with the soil. Here's some context that I want everybody to understand. Please understand that's the soil on the left all of our soils, all the soils before humans, when this thing, when the planet was created by the living God, it was beautiful. It was, look at the soil on the left. That's what it was. Look what man has done on the right. Those are the same soils. Monoculture, till systems, that's the same soil, believe it or not. Look what we've done. So first thing I tell people, always understand your context when I walk on a farm and operation, if I'm invited to Hawaii and I'm gonna go uh, look at uh, producers places, I assume the right until I'm proven otherwise. And I'll show you what the first things I start looking when I'm out there on the land. But these are the four common processes I look right away. I look at this when I walk on every farm, I don't care it's from Canada to Hawaii to Puerto Rico. These four processes, I look at it every time. First one, how much diversity of plants is on that operation at any given time? I want to increase diversity within space and time. Living plants, without plants and soil, there is no climate, period. You have rock and ice. Without living plants and the sun working together, you can't have a water cycle. And without a water cycle, you can then have a nutrient cycle. No water, no nutrients. Those microbes focus on nutrients. And the last one is diversity. Diversity is powerful. This planet works on diversity. Diversity is the software, ladies and gentlemen. It's the software without insects and bugs and critters and microbes and plants. We live on a rock with ice. Diversity is powerful, is the most powerful tool that we have in our toolbox on the farm and ranch. Let's start with the first process. Right now, we have to remember that the plant and soil one. 
The moment you harvest a crop, you got to make it one again. This is the way the plant so eats. The ancient called the plant the mouth of the soil. Without soil, there's no microbes, period. They coexist. Should have never been taught separately. They exist together. This right here is a plant leaking root exudates. This is liquid sun, hundreds and thousands of compounds feeding the soil microbes. Right now, our farms and ranches should be running on new sunlight. This is new sunlight, not ancient sunlight, diesel, fertilizer, and chemicals. The more we put living plants in that soil, the more new sunlight. I want to do this. The moment I put living roots, I have biology. I have those microbes multiplying. They make nutrients available. They take the mineral. Them and fungus and plants bring zinc minerals out of the rock. They do that. More plants, more carbon flow, more nutrient density, more for the, so you get more microbes, more fungi, the plant picks up the nutrients, the animal picks up the nutrients, and then we get the nutrients. A lot of our health and disease issues lack because we have not enough carbon flow. We're not feeding the microbes enough. These are some of the microbes identified in the soil. Look at the ones that pr produce iron and boron and manganese. It's amazing. Bacteria, that's, that's what they do. Make boron and iron available. They make carbon available. They can make nitrogen available by themselves. It is incredible that when we bring the plant and the microbes to bear, the whole soil system changes. So unfortunately, this is a common pattern throughout our country. This is a common pattern. Right now, if you drive through the United States and go from California to North Carolina, you see the left. The ground is bare. We only capture sun about 120 days out of the year. This is the farm on the right is Pennsylvania. In the early spring, this picture was taken in the early spring. Which producer is protecting the soil habitat? Which one knows that the soil is alive? Which one is sequestering nutrients from not running off. Which one is protecting the soil? Which one is feeding the soil? The farmer and the rancher on the right. I tell people, if we could do one thing for regenerative agriculture, if we can cover the soil throughout the United States, we would change the climate just by making it green. And we would fix our water quality issues. We would start reducing inputs etc that little butterfly effect why should we care well this is a this is a picture of 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 um, a great picture of showing the complexity and how plants make an impact in uh, in our eco regions and this is called secondary secession on the left you can see is annual weeds this is typical our agriculture nitrate dependent but as we move to no-till, we become more into like the shrubs and more fungi. We make or more organic nitrogen available. It is very critical to understand secondary succession and how nature does it. So in other words, if we start stop farming in the Midwest, it would go back to prairie. This is the direction nature wants to go to. We keep it to the left. I'll give you an example. This is our soils predominantly Bacteria dominant, not good at managing carbon, leaky nutrients. We want to move our soils to the right, more carbon, more aggregated. We'll talk about that later. Okay, it matters what type of vegetation. You can see here on the grass line vegetation. This is why the Midwest has some of the most deepest soils in the world. Grasslands are the most deepest soil organic matter in the world. In the tropics, all the carbons on the top on the trees and the leaves. That's why there's only four or five places in the world that have soils like Iowa and Illinois, Argentina, Ukraine, a little bit in China. These soils are so deep, they were created by grasslands. That's why when I design my cover crop mixes, I always have grasses predominantly in my mixes. How does this impact? 
it makes a huge impact. Look at cropland, look at prairie, look at forest. Look at the bacteria counts in each of those, in those type of systems. This is one teaspoon of soil, 100 to 1 billion, up to 7 billion bacteria, as many humans in one tablespoon as there is humans on the planet. But the one that I want you to observe is look at the fungi. In our typical cropping system, we have very low fungi and fungi are very critical for ecosystem services. Look at forest, one to 40 miles of fungi in one teaspoon. It makes a huge difference how we manage. So what makes prairies and forests different from cropland? They're covered with plants 24 seven. In fact, we picked up all the principles of soil health for mimicking the prairie and the forest. They don't till, carbon flow is great. We'll talk about that some more. In these bacteria dominant systems, which you see in the left, you can see it's very weedy, heavily tilled systems, lots of nitrogen fertilizer, excessive use of fertilizers and pesticides and manure, bacteria dominant systems. We wanna move more to the right. We wanna be more balance of fungal and bacteria. We want our crop systems to be more like that. The more we can do that, the less ancient sunlight we need, less fertilizer, less pesticides, less all of these by just making our soils more fungal dominant. Give you an example, one of the kickback, blowback I got was, well, Ray, if I put plants in it, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to uh, plant my crop because it's, it's gonna be cooler. Well, what makes and regulates temperature and moisture is living plants. Look at the temperature difference on that. I will say this to you, you don't have to read this 460 page book by Dr. Geiker. Plants regulate temperature and moisture. So the more we use the cover crops, we can regulate temperature and moisture. Let me give an example. Look at this right here. There's a great example of how microbial activity on the right-hand side with no-till and the conventional. Look at the difference. Why is the snow melted more in the no-till? Because the pore spaces are bigger, less disruptive, more disruptive to fungi, more so you're going to have higher temperatures in these type of systems with distur lower disturbed soil systems, less tillage, more cover crops. Look at the temperature differences. It makes a big difference. That butterfly effect of not tilling and covering the soil makes a huge difference. Now, here's a common pattern I want us to realize. Notice in the forest, since many of you have walked in the forest, that is the skin of the forest. That leaf has a huge impact. It prevents crusting. It's the habitat for the microbes. It protect, it stops impact of rain, heavy rain impact. It feeds the microbes. That skin is critical. That's why we're trying to mimic that. When we roll our cover crops down, we're trying to create that skin. Picture on the right, if you move the, res if you move the grass blades, and you dig into the grass, guess what you find is detritus. That's that skin, that desiccated, dried up grass, creating the skin. We need to create that skin in our systems. Look how critical that skin is. Look at the temperature of that roll cereal rye on the right and look at bare ground on the left. This is a very common thing, even throughout the United States, the way we farm through Hawaii, a lot of bare ground, as the crop is coming out. When you roll your cover crop and have that instant skin, biomimicry, mimicking nature, we get less weeds, we suppress weeds, we feed the microbes, we regulate the temperature and moisture. Awesome. Now we'll talk about the water cycle. This is a great little video that was done and posted on Facebook by a friend of mine. And it'll show you, as, he, as you can see, he's driving down the road, you can see, uh, 12 rows of uh, no-till, 12 rows of conventional. Look at the water ponding up through tillage, destroying aggregation. 12 rows of cover crop. Notice no water ponding up. 12 more rows of cover crops. 12 rows of no-till. Again, 12 rows of conventional. What does tillage do to the soil? It, it destroys aggregation. I'll show you that in a second. But here's the most powerful tool 
that you can use. To, it's one great tool, I, one of my indicator tools. Remember I was talking back to human health? This is one of the tools, you know, doctors use blood pressure or blood samples, the one powerful indicator to tell whether you're healthy or not. This is one of them that is very powerful. They say the eye is the window to the soul. The shovel is the window to the soil soul. Let's peek into that amazing by one shovel. When I walk to now, when I walk to a farm, if I was invited to go, I'd go right. First thing I do is I'll walk to an area where it has not been farmed for a long time. I go to the fence row where it's got a weed patch, grass patch that's been there for a long time. And then I go to the field and I'll sit there and I'll compare them. And this is what I typically see. The fence rows is on the left. Well, aggregated cottage cheese, a lot of BBs. Look at the color on the right. The same thing, go to the fence row. I always do that. Do and grab a shovel and be honest with yourself. Go where it has not been farmed for 50, 70 years and compare yourself. Too many times we judge ourselves with our neighbor. We should be judging ourselves with the natural system. I use that shovel, great indicator tool. This is what I'm looking for, aggregation. Those aggregates, what's an aggregate? It is the fusion of sand, silts, and clays created by microbes, the sticky glues that create and fuse the sands and silts and clays together to create pore space, to create lungs. This change every 27 days. What destroys aggregates? Excessive tillage, leaving the ground bare, too much fertilizer, too much manure, overuse of legumes. Microbes will eat the aggregation. They do not stop eating. Having not enough living plants, leaving the ground bare. It is hard on the soil. It's the way we manage impact aggregation. We want to build aggregation. Poor crop rotations also impacted. Let me show you the tillage. Same soil, but look at the soil on the top. It now back into its parent material. The one on the bottom is a well aggregated soil created by those super glue of those microbes and the fungi. So when you till, you wake up bacteria and they start, they're called our strategists, and they eat the glues. They eat the organic matter that hold the sands and silts and clays. Soil collapse, water ponds up. Let me show you how powerful those this glues are. And so this was a picture of a buddy of mine from Kansas. This is monoculture wheat. This is in central Kansas. And he's got a probe in his hand and it's in the middle of winter, only 14 degrees. And he's putting the probe inside and notice how hard this is monoculture wheat. Yep, what you expect, no infiltration, right? It's frozen, right? That's what you would say. Look at the next picture. Same situation, I apologize for the poor video, but watch him go and he's pointed to, a, he pointed to the, the wheat. Now he's in a multi-species winter mix that he planted two times, one in the summer and one in the winter. And look what happens, look at the probe, he's gonna stick in the ground. If you can see it, there you go. There There we go, where are we go, there we go, where are we go. Okay, now he's gonna do it. There's the probe. All of a sudden it goes all the way in. How in the world, in the monoculture wheat, it did not go in, but the multi-species mix, during the winter, there was porosity, there was aggregation all the way down. What's the impact? Less, less compaction, that means more infiltration, more temperature for the microbes. It's not frozen. Huge implications. That little butterfly effect of plenty in that mix made a huge difference. And that mix on top of the surface also stops the snow, the snow so that they can capture snow. And that also helps them get more moisture in a very limited moisture environment like theirs. It matters how you farm. Look at the rotational grazing. Look how dark it is on the top part of that and that profile. Look at continuous grazing when you keep taking too much plants 
Look at the difference in colors. Look at the infiltration rates on the columns. Look at the crop length. Half an inch per hour, continuous grazing when you just let the cows and the animals take too much and look at the rotational, 12.4. Big, huge difference. Look at the rangeland. One of the most destructive things we do carelessly is hayland. We take too much hay. We, we don't graze it. We don't give it time to rest. We don't give it time to recover. We take too much. Look at the hayland infiltration, 0.59 inches versus 27 inches in the rain. Same soil type. This was taken in South Dakota, Stan Bolts. Now, let's talk about nutrient cycle. Without getting water into the soil, you impact the nutrient cycle. It's incredibly, incredibly important. That's another indicator. If, if I, I'm getting poor nutrient cycling, it's I'm getting poor water cycling. I'm not capturing enough sun. Those are all connected. This is connectedness here. If I impact any of these in the food web, I impact the whole system. Now I have to buy more fertilizer. I'm gonna to have to use more insecticide. All these are self-healing, self-regulating, self-organizing. These organisms regulate themselves. But if you're always spraying, you're always tilling, you break up this connectedness. That's why you need to understand the connectedness of things. I tell people, this is the real nutrient cycle. Oop, it's not plain, but here, is the nutrient cycle. And you'll see that these organisms will be breaking down this residue on the right and incorporating it with the earthworms. But my video is not working. But here's the thing. Geology, all of us, what do we have in common with Hawaii? Geology. We got sand, silt, and clay. But here's what every farmer does not have in common. How they manage diversity and the lives and the animals. Geology plus the byproducts of life Good management, creating those super glues by fungi and bacteria and living plants, create soil. What creates delineation? How we manage biology, how we manage, how we understand the system. This is not the nutrient cycle, ladies and gentlemen. I will say this. This is sugar. It's a stimulant. It is not the nutrient cycle. We know now that sugar is ply one of the things that's leading to a lot of our sickness in our, in our natural, in our human body, obesity, a lot of it, processed food. Fertilizer is a stimulant. It is a tool, careful. Doesn't that mean that I don't have a piece of chocolate once in a while? Yeah, everything in balance. It's a tool. It is not the nutrient cycle. Thing I want you to understand too, is very important. I used, my wife and I went to go visit the redwood trees. Look how huge those trees, each of those trees weigh 4.2 million pounds. Who would have thought that most of that thing is water, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon? Very little comes from the soil. Less than 5% of that comes from the soil. So next time you look at your pineapple, you're eating a majority of it is air. Most of it comes from the air. When you see your bananas, when you see your corn growing, 95% of it is from the air. Less than 5% comes from the soil. That's why it's measured in parts per million. From the air. <laughs> I never understood that. Now, last one for the last process, the diversity. This is the software. All of us have a smartphone. Every one of us. Majority of us, some of us have a flip phone. Even a flip phone has software. This is the software of the planet, ladies and gentlemen. The diversity of living plants, organisms, insects, they run the hardware. The hardware is the rock, the ice of this planet, the geology. But without the software, there would be no life. Our goal is to bring more life within space and time into our operation. That is our most powerful tool. This is where I learned this. I never forgot this. This changed my life. It was in 2006. I was working for NRCS at this time. 
Gabe Brown and the guys and ranchers in in Burley and County and the district conservationists did this plot test plots. That year, I found out that collaboration is more powerful than competition. Competition does happen in our planet, but it builds integrity, but it runs on collaboration. Let me show you how that works. In 2006, they planted some test plots. That year, they only got 1.8 inches of rain. Can you imagine that in Hawaii, 1.8 inches of rain only the whole season? This is what they did. They planted a test plot of lupin, oil seed, pasha, purple, cowpea, all in these plots. And look how much dry matter they got in that. But when they mixed the two plots, the last two plots together, and they mixed them together, all the seed, look what happened. Monoculture, turnip, monoculture, oil seed. Remember, these are plots right next to each other. And look what happened after well, only 1.8 inches of rain. And look what happened when they put them all together. How could that happen? When they threw all the seeds together in that plot with only 1.8 inches. And you can see in the background, you can see in the background, you can see the brown plots, the monoculture. How can it be if I mix them together? I thought plants steal water. They steal nutrients. They compete from each other. Dr. Mark Bartness wrote in the ecology letters, it's called the stress gradient hypothesis. When plants are really stressed, they do not compete, but they collaborate. They collaborate. When humans are on incredible stress, they collaborate. We all collaborate. Will you watch what happens with this tornado that went through Kentucky and killed a lot of people? You're going to have massive collaboration. Natural systems do that. You're saying, but that only happens in North Dakota. I've had people tell me that. God loves North Dakota, but doesn't love the rest of the planet. I've heard people say that. This is a test plot in Canada. On the foreground is Tony Kaler by itself. There on the background is a mix. This is Canada. Same thing occurred. Look how beautiful and healthy when you planted it together versus you, you planted it separately. So this is the architecture that we want to mimic, ladies and gentlemen, on every part of our farms, whether in a pasture, whether we're intercropping, polycropping, I want to see different plants, uh, uh, surface leaf, a width of plants, different structure, different architecture on the top and in the bottom. That is my goal. Because if I do that, then I bring these guys. I create habitat. 1,700 beneficials for one pest insect, self-regulating mechanism. So if we start bringing more diversity. Can you imagine if we paid farmers for five, seven way mixes instead of worrying about cover, carbon? Take a satellite imagery. Let me see your seed you planted. Boom, you get paid. Done. We're done. Bring habitat. Cover the planet with diversity. Let me show you in New Mexico, what I, I grew up in New Mexico. This is where I went to college at, Las Cruces, this desert area, the growing pecans. We grew pecans like this and irrigated. This is what we were taught. You do not grow anything in your orchards because it's going to compete. They're going to steal nutrients and water. And now we don't do that anymore. We cover it. And I lost the slide. I apologize. But I have a slide that shows that all green. Maybe I'll find it in my next to my slide deck. So wrapping it up here, um, here's what I want to tell you. We have, this is the main problem we have. It's called death by tools. We are killing ourselves through massive tillage, over haying, too much pesticides, too much fertilizer. Good example of this picture is look at Costa Rica. Same thing would be in Hawaii. Look at all the insects. Look at the plants. Look at South Africa. Look at Iowa. What do we do in Iowa? Excessive tillage, a lot of fertilizers, a lot of pesticides, a lot of continuous disturbance, a lot of stress to the system. So if you impact the mycorrhizae, you impact the springtails, you impact the whole system, the whole system starts to collapse. It becomes an issue. Let me give you a, a, a visual 
from the microscope. This is Michael Thompson, no-till cover crops and grazing animals. Look at the difference in the life in that, in that, in that soil. Why, why is that soil so alive? Does not disturb the habitat. Got living plants growing all the time. Now look at the next slide. This is no-till, lots of chemicals. Look at the difference. Remind you again and go back again so you can see it again. So that covers, blame the principles of, of, of the soil health principles, diverse living roots 24 seven, no tillage, reducing chemicals, grazing animals, limiting disturbance. Look at this, what happens. And look at here with lots of disturbance, lots of chemical disturbance. It's no till, but no till is not enough. And so the problem is, is here. Since the 1920s to now, a lot of the producers' cost is going to inputs. The wealth of agriculture, of the local community, is not going to the local community. The blessings of the land used to flow through the farmer and rancher. Now it goes to corporate America, to the tool makers. Am I opposed to the tool makers? No, that's not what I'm getting at. But the blessing should go first to the tool, to the farmer and rancher, and then to the local community. That's where it should go. Farmers have not been making money for many of years. You're talking about demographics that have not, that have suffered through the years has been farmers and ranchers. I'm gonna show you and wrap it up with a case study of a young farmer that shows how the butterfly effect happened in his life how tiny things that he started to change impacted his whole life. This is Macaulay Kincaid. He was, he won, uh, he got future regenerative farmer for Soil Health U. This young man is only 27, 28 years old. Let me show you how this young man started. This is a picture of his mom, his dad passed away, died of cancer. Mac did not have an easy start. He had a rough family life. His father left him 59 acres. They started off with 59 acres. He did not have much. He had a very rough start in his life. But certain things in his life, certain butterfly effects changed his whole outcome. He hasn't, the person he married, the people that came in contact and the, the, the type of person that Mac is, changed his whole outcome. He is now doing a tornado of good throughout the country in teaching. This young farmer started with 59 acres. Now he's farming 650 acres. He is located in Jasper um, uh, in Missouri. I'm in Springfield. I live right here. I'm only about an hour and 30 minutes from the young man. This young man has now 650 acres, started out with 59. He's got 80 cows now. He grazes, uh, he custom grazes 150 uh, cow calf. He's got laying hens. He calls them a nonprofit because he hasn't made much profit on them yet. And that's the nonprofit organization on his farm. And he does cover crop seeds. He sells cover crop seed. Look how diverse. And with that young man started with 59 acres and a very, a uh, horrible situation where he lost his father young and many, many, many dysfunctional things. And look what that young man has done in such a little time. Let's look at his ecological context. Look at the Missouri in his area, in Southwest Missouri, very shallow soils. They're not amazing soils. They can be quite productive, they can, but look at the erosion that's occurring, very rocky. They're not awesome soils. He gets about 42 inches of rain, and he leases the land that nobody else wants. But because he understands the principles, he can make it very productive and has allowed him to buy another farm because he was, he understood. He started no-till in 2012 and he started with soybeans. Then he started cover crops in 2013. He was told by everybody in that region, you can't make no-till work here. It will not work. And his first no-till corn was 90 bushel and his neighbors were all 120 and they told him, we told you, but 
he didn't understand what was missing until so he he was he was kind of in a really bad situation because the banker he was running out of money he was uh, he was having a hard time financially his wife was getting stressed he was getting stressed so he was kind of really stuck but then certain butterfly events happened to him in his life he got a, he got exposed to gay brown and, and myself i don't take the credit but he said he heard me speak on youtube Gabe and I, we're just conduits and, and we're just a little butterfly doing like the rest of you are doing. He heard our talk and he first heard Gabe. He first heard Gabe. He said, that Gabe Brown doesn't know what he's talking. He doesn't know what farming at all. Then he came across my YouTube, heard me and I referenced Gabe. He went back and then he started to change everything in his operation. Then he started to focus on all these principles, context, minimize all these we talk about, we've talked about this before. So what are the butterfly things he did? What changed his commitment? What did he start to do in his operation? He followed all these principles, but he did it logistically this way. He got rid of double crop soybeans. He started to cover every acre. He stretched his rotations. He adjusted his planting dates. He changed his maturity of his, he started to go into shorter varieties to allow more room for cover crops. He created a farm budget, started to budget his money, diversify his cash crops, diversity, diversity, diversity. He became incredibly intentional. He became very committed. The top regenerative farmers throughout the planet are incredibly passionate, committed, and very intentional. And he started to move the cattle daily. Those little tiny butterfly events changed his economic, and we'll talk about it in a second, outlook, changed his whole operation so that this young man can farm and pass the farm to the next generation. Recently, to give you some more of his context, Last year, they had 100 inches through the year, 100 inches. It's almost like Hawaii. That's how normal the, the, our system has become, our climate. The top picture on the right is a tilled soil system. And look at it, look at it, and then his no-till system. Very little runoff. They added droughts. So we have a lot of rain, a lot of drought. This is the neighbors. This is Max now in 2020. He's on the right. With 160 bushel, the people lost and they had to claim crop insurance in this short time. And so here's where Max started uh, realizing if you notice corn, if you notice cover crops, by adding cover crops, it increased the water holding capacity to his soil by 41%. In soybeans, it increased it by 44%. We've been saying this. No-till without cover crops is not good, healthy, regenerative farming. you got to have the cover crops. Look at how much, how much it cost to do tillage, to create dirt, to take soil out of its context. No-till cost $54, all his operations. By the time he, and so it runs the combine, that's all it costs, two pass. When you do vertical till or field cultivation, $68. Chisel plow, field cultivation, 84. Four passes. Strip till, $72 a pass. Look at the economics on that. This is what changed his whole life. Look at the land payment, his property tax, miscellaneous expenses, his crop insurance, his cover crops, he sows all his expenses. His, look how little nitrogen he uses. Typically for a bushel of corn, you're supposed to use 150. He's down to 80. He uses non-GMO. He's planting green. Herbicides, he's reduced his herbicides, three or four herbicides. His, cop, his production costs are $399. His yields are 160 bushel. Even at corn at $5, he is making $401 an acre. The average farmer in the United States, besides this, are making only $50 to $70 an acre if they're lucky, if the government's not helping. 
Mac is getting to a point, this young farmer is going to get to a point that he will eventually not will farm on his own money and not even use the government money. Mac went to our one of our soil health academy schools. That little change made a huge difference in the life. But it wasn't just that. Mac is always learning. He's always growing. He's like a lot of you that came today and spent their precious time. I always know where people are at when they're willing to do these two incredible things, give up their money and give up their time. And the most precious of that is their time. It is amazing to me that people will buy equipment, but yet they won't spend any money to go get educated. That just boggles my mind. This is why we started the Soul Health Academy, a nonprofit so that we can teach farmers and ranchers how to emulate and mimic nature, to learn how to apply logistically this six principles. I would say, Mr. Rick Clark, a very famous organic no-till farmer in Illinois, I mean, Indiana said to me, Ray, there should be a seventh principle. And that brings perfect symmetry. Be intentional, be committed. There are many people that come to the schools. There are many people that come to learn. There are many people that go to church, but there are very few people that apply it and are intentional and they live it in their lives. I strive to be more intentional. All of us have to strive to be intentional and to be committed. So I'm going to wrap it up here. So understand the principles, have good data so that you can make good decisions and have a position of strength. You have to have all these things. In fact, I probably should just back off and, and help you here because again, I talked about indicators, about how your human body works. When you go to a doctor, he looks at all kinds of indicators. I look at all kinds of indicators, whether your soil is working the same way. I do the shovel test. I do a Haney test. I do a phospholipid fatty acid test. We do all these indicators, organic matter, CEC, base saturations, all of these indicators to know where you're at. All these producers do this. They always are collecting data, always checking the pulse of their soil and where they're at. Water infiltration, aggregate stability, the plant bricks. Do they have diversity? Are they looking at the plants? They're walking out there. A soil's fertility is in proportion to the number of footsteps you take on it. So we use all these parameters, all these tests, check strips, water sensors, slake tests, infiltration to determine function, to determine health. All these are done together. Again, understanding principles. I rather you understand the principles. That's number one in applying the logistics of it. Then the data, good decisions, gives you position of strength. Wrapping it up, soil's alive. <laughs> it's incredibly life. All is connected. Careful how you do things, how you manage logistically your, your practices and what you do on the land. It can have a tornado effect downward to destruction or upward of building. Mimic nature, watch her principles, obey them religiously. Understand patterns of all the four ecosystem processes. Mimic life, the goal is not cover crops. The goal is not no-till. The goal is to mimic life. Mimic the patterns of the design. Follow the design of the creation, what the creator did. The last one, be committed. Be very committed. I'm gonna tell you, I've gone all over. This is the biggest problem right here. It's our mindset. I am 99% of my problem. I get up in the morning, my struggle is me. It's not what's going around me. It is me and how I view the world and how am I gonna to respond to it. How I respond can change everything. It can change your whole life. It matters, every little thing you do does matter. All the people you come in contact make a difference. This conference, this tiny butterfly will change Hawaii. 
of all the things, mindset is the most important. You don't have the right mindset, you will not pick up the skills. And you will not, if you don't have the right skills, you will not use the tools correctly. Last slide. Regenerative agriculture is a journey of humility. Oh, I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I had to be humbled. When I left college, I was so arrogant. I went to college. I know all this knowledge and I knew nothing. And the more I've gone in this, this, down this journey, the less I know. And so when somebody tells me, oh, Ray, you did this, I did nothing. I know nothing. I, I, am, I have been so blessed that I've met so many people through my whole career that have changed my trajectory. If it wasn't so for the right book, like Ellen Savory's book, if I hadn't come in contact with people like Gabe or other people and other ranchers and other farmers, I'd still be where I'm at. It was by God's divine deterministic in my life, that determinism that changed my whole outlook. What is regenerative agriculture? It's a journey of humility, how you look at other farmers that understand that they may be in other parts of the journey. The real journey when your heart changes and that's humble and you change your mind and you know what the real goal, you don't go on to your intellectual knowledge. I thought I had all the knowledge. I thought this was the right way to go. If it doesn't teach you how to mimic nature, give glory to the creation and mimic the design, whether within your body or in the natural system, humbly walk away. I have had to learn the hard way through much suffering. I saw many, many farmers lose their farms and ranchers, or I mean their, their ranches, and they could not bring their son and their daughter in the operation because they had the wrong goal. They had the wrong mindset. I wanna thank you, Vincent, for having me today. And, and I hope that your operation continues to be that butterfly effect that would change agriculture and create a tornado of change in your in beautiful Hawaii. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna open it up for questions and answers. Right on, Ray. Ray, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got a, a couple questions right off the bat here. So Ray, um, hey, uh, mahalo, man. Oh. Appreciate the mahalo. table. And um, we have a question here from Arthur. Can you talk about the use of functional groups in companion planting systems? Mixing oh, yes. Plates, which are most important to include? Yes, very good question. And when you get the functional groups, you're talking about a grass, broadleaf, shrubbery, in prairie systems, there's functional groups. When I design my mixness, I'm very cautious how many legumes I put into the mix. And so it's a legume. If you go to natural systems, the way you see legumes in natural ecosystems, they're sparingly. They're not predominant. What's predominant are grasses. So when I, depending on, my, on the crop that I'm growing, I design my mix and my functional groups are in accordance. But I'm very cautious not to make my legume component, that functional group, not more than 10 to 15%. Because if you have too much legumes in the system, what you'll do is you leak nitrogenous compounds into the soil and the, and the microbes will eat the aggregates. Alfalfa, for example, if you grow nothing but a pure stand of alfalfa, what do you notice? The ground becomes like rock, it's hard too much legumes, too much carbon removal. Soybean, we've seen after soybean, that's a legume, a functional group of a plant. You do that by itself after 20, they, in the beginning of the season, we did 20 inches per hour, the butter infiltrate after legumes went down to 10. Please understand that the plant, the soil is always eating. It balances its diet by carbon and nitrogen. Do not separate those two components. So the plants that you bring into the system are very critical, uh, not only how your following crop's gonna be, but how you maintain the soil function and how you excite soil biology. Excellent question. Functional groups are critical. So when I design my mixes, my predominant functional group are grasses first. 
but I want all of them to be manifested in my mix if I, if I can. So that's, I strive for that all the time. Those four basic functional groups are very critical. Ray, what, what is your thoughts on biological mutation? Mutation meaning what? Uh, in biological, uh, there's my, uh, biological, adding biologicals into the soil or mutation in reference to what? Give me some more context. Yeah, is it more like pleomorphism? Transmutation, I'm sorry. Biological transmutation. Well, um, give me a little bit more of that so I make sure I'm, I'm, I'm dressing it in the proper context. Let me see. Arthur asked this question. Arthur, are you there? That you could uh, elaborate on what you're... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, we'll wait for him to jump in. Um, because, because one thing from a biological systems... I don't know if he's talking about this, but one thing I do know, natural systems adapt. And so they change to the condition. They can modify their habitat. Give you an example. Bacteria can change the pH in the soil. They modify it. Plants and soils and microbes can modify pH. They can modify it. Right. They can change that whole system. So Natural systems are adapt. That's why we, we talk about grazing. We call it adaptive grazing. We have to adapt to the climate, to the temperature, to the cow, to the animal, to the sheep, uh, uh, the moisture. We, we always have to be watching in, in an adaptive process. Nature adapts. It changes all the time. That it'll, it'll and, and I don't know if transmutate would be, now I do know, well, case in point, and I don't know if he, we know now, Many of you guys know about Chernobyl, 1985, 86, I was 20 some years old. Chernobyl blew up, sent a radioactive plume that, uh, uh, that power plant blew up. Recently, they found fungi that they're called radiotrophs. They eat radiation. They eat radiation. So that's how powerful that the system can adapt and change. And I don't know if that's what he's meaning by that. Can't hear you, uh, Vincent. Okay. Uh, that was, that, that is very powerful. I, I know one of the, uh, you know, uh, Paul Stamis was talking about how the, all the mycelium on petrochemical spills are cleaning up petrochemical uh, spills. Yep. Um, yep. You know, yesterday we had Dan Kittredge on that's developing the bio-nutrient meter. And that was really a profound um, presentation in the spirit of, you know, truly, I mean, all that you're talking about here, you're speaking to where the rubber meets the road and the quality of the food that's produced and the quality of the soil that's produced by, by that. And one of the biggest limiting factors that comes forward in our, in our movement forward when we talk about the importance of soil health is first thing out of the mouth or the first pushback is, well, does it make economic sense? You know, it's always an economic uh, 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 parameter in the sense that, you know, it's short-term thinking. Um, and so, you know, uh, I remember when Jerry Brunetti would present on the uh, prairie lands and how the roots were so deep from the perennial grasses that you speak about that um, they could hear them for, for miles away when they're ripping them up for king corn. Um, I, I see where there's a lot of, you know, within National Farmers Union, there's some farmers that, that are still feeding off of those deep humic rich soils that even though they've been beating them up, they're still working, you know what I mean? Um, how do we, how do we, I, I think that quantifying, quantifying the quality of the food is where really the rubber's gonna meet the road in that respect, yeah, right? But yeah, and Vincent, look, I, I just shared a case study with Mac. Mac started, look how that young man started with 59 acres. He almost lost that acres. Now he's very successful. He's doing very well financially. This young man now owns 600 acres. He's only 27 years old, Vincent. And people, when you work with nature, it, it's very expensive to work against the natural system. It's very costly. All we're telling you is if you work with it and flow with it, that tiny cover crop, that cover crop that you put out there, you're wondering if it makes a difference. 
it makes a huge difference. Right. It right. makes a difference. Are you working with the natural system? Or are you working against it? Right now, fertilizer, Vincent, in the United States for anhydrous is $1,500 a ton. It used to be 500 a ton. Well, see, that's the Mac, thing. Uh, I have a senator sitting next to me. This is uh, Senator Mike Gabbard. Here, he's the Senate Ag Chair. And, I'm and, almost in it there. And, and, I, and I was uh, speaking to him about the, you know, that at the legislature, um, there's, there's a lot of people like making sure that these, these uh, legislators are continuing to buy the petrochemical model. And um, yep. so, you know, uh, we just want to have a, um, we, want, we want to be able to quantify what it is we know to be true. And so it's really, well, it's really good to see that there's some movement being made towards um, nutrient density of the food, being able to quantify the nutrient density of the food, yeah. Well, and, and I'll tell you what, Vincent, look, a lot of our medical problems, we have a lot of sickness, a lot of obesity, a lot of it's linked back to our soil. You, we cannot disconnect. There's two big pharmas, big pharma with farm, the industrial farming, and there's big pharma, pH, same thing. They, it's all about, there's only one way to farm. There's only one way to cure a virus. There's only one way. It's always one approach. In natural system, there's never just one way. I was taught you can only use fertilizer and chemicals and pesticides. That's the only thing you can do to farm. That's what I was taught. I was wrong. It's not that way. It's, it's learning how to farm with nature. Now I teach how to work with the natural system. And so it, it's a total different approach. Well, you're, you know, the way you, um, you've always spoken about it uh, to me is uh, emulating Earth's architecture, you know, that, yeah. that, that encapsulates uh, that whole posture of, of how we show up. Uh, Arthur came back with the transmutation and uh, uh, articulating his question. He said, many soils are missing key elementals. Is it generally, it is generally believed that elements cannot be created, but there is now evidence that biology can solve this issue without having to bring in amendments. That's an excellent question. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, Dr. David Johnson from New Mexico State. You know, look, I used to think, Vincent, that once you have sodic saline soils that you can, you cannot, you're stuck. You, you're stuck with it because you got elemental of salt and it's, and, it's, and it's preventing the plant from taking up water. It's dying of thirst. It destroys the structure. We know now when you have fungi and bacteria and you got carbon flowing through the system, these fungi have an ability to release these bio, uh, these um, bio messengers that can actually transform the salt ion and make it inert. Just what he was talking about. Uh, we don't understand the power of life. And so does it happen? Yes, it does happen. We've seen it with our sodic, sodic saline soils and how we're able to remediate it with carbon flow, covers, living manure. It's simple. Soil wants three things from you. Living plant, diverse living plants, diverse living animals, and for you to have relationship with it. That's it. It's, it's, it's that simple. You know, Ray, we have two of our um, uh, leaders here this weekend uh, that are, uh, have been working a long time with um, EM technology from, uh, for Bokashi's and then also IMO's, uh, Korean Natural Farming. And David Wong, we visited his farm on Oahu and he, has a dairy, and the, he took over the old dairy and uh, when, we, when we had our convention at our YNI chapter at Kahumana Farms in 2017, we brought the National Farmers Union folks that were here to celebrate us being, becoming chartered at that convention to his farm. And they couldn't believe how close they could get to the pigs. There was no smell, no flies. And then when we walked down to the crops that were being grown, there was all this salt, rock salt on the road. You know, as the, 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 the university said, you can't farm these areas because they're too salty. So it's specifically, and they, it was thriving. The, the, the soils were growing amazing gingers and moringa. And uh, so, you know, it speaks to what you just shared there and what Arthur's pointing to. So that's great. Yeah, uh, yeah, Arthur's right. And look, as an NRCS employee, I used to write 
uh, nutrient management plants for these big CAFOs and, and these big operations, please understand, and I want everybody in the audience to understand this, we created these systems. It happened, and, and sometimes we tend to uh, blame farmers and ranchers, but really it was our educational system. It was our, 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 our cultural, everything. We all shifted this way. Right. And so we're trying to shift to another way, like you're talking about, Vince, in a way that's more healthy for the animals and more that facilitates life. But please understand, when we talk about conventional producers, I was a conventional producer. I promoted, I, I supported that. Right. What we're saying now is we have to transition them slowly with humility and patience and love for the producers. But sometimes there's a lot of groups blaming the producers for doing this. We wanted cheap food. We That's need right. to understand what, what's happened in the last 60, 70, 80 years. This thing, there's a lot of people, you got less than one or 2% of the people feeding 350 million pe people. Yes. Right. So, so remember, we created this construct. It was based on the wrong premise. So what, I hope that we're very patient, very careful in how we communicate to our other brothers and sisters. Ray, you know, you hit the nail on the head about that, because I, I like to share with people, you know, I don't know of any farmer, I don't care what practice they're, they're practicing, that wakes up in the morning and goes, so how can I poison people, and how can I compact yeah. my soils, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, yeah. yeah, it's not, in her, and, but they were taught, this is how they were taught, and you know, and so you really have crossed and built a, a wonderful bridge, Ray, in the work that you did within our NRCS, know that, you know, and now that you're retired and, and, and working from where you're working from now, know that I'm working directly with, and I think I mentioned to you, uh, Travis Thomason, Pacific Re uh, Region Director of NRCS, and bringing forward a soil health initiative here in Hawaii. And we have all the agricultural sector at the table, Senator Gabbard's at the table. You know, we have uh, uh, Amy Peruzzo, our vice chair of the yeah. uh, House yeah. Committee there. So it's really a wonder, the private sector's there. So we're, we're working to bring about a, uh, uh, an overall, a broad approach to, uh, uh, you know, solving some of these things. And one of the ideas is to get it to where the legislature can create policy that will support private sector investment into a legacy fund. So they can leave a legacy of their money as opposed to a return on investment and, and yeah. be able to have that money then have their name on it. Like, you know, you see New Orleans, a stadium having Mercedes on it or whatever, you know, just to be able to have an agricultural system that is that is uh, supported by people who are making a lot of money and who want to make a difference with that money. Because as the saying goes, you don't see a U-Haul trailer behind a hearse, you know, yeah. we, we need to really be able to leave and that we made a difference here while we were here for future generations. So in that yeah. humility that you bring about and I bless your heart, Ray, you know, the knowledge that you have and the difference that you make in the people out there and to, and, to, and, to, and to state the importance of humility. Well, I take my hair off to you, brother. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you some, Vincent. And, you know, <laughs> hey, hey, Vincent, you know, I talked to Secretary Vilsack about two months ago. I got a chat, a chat with Secretary Good. Vilsack. He's and changed. Being in the, He's changed. Yes. I, look, he watched the movie. He watched the movie Kiss the Ground. And at the end of the Zoom meeting, I said, look, I've come to realize one simple thing, guys. If we can do this one simple thing globally, let's cover the soil. I said, Secretary Vilsack, I've worked for the government. It's hard for us to even carry out one thing right. What did we draw from California all the way to North Carolina? And during the fall and the spring, it would be green. Can you imagine what that would do for the planet? It would be huge. And he said, you're right, Ray. It, it would, it he would love to see that. We have way too much bare ground. Imagine going through Hawaii and the ground is always covered with a living plant. Even after they have to harvest, they cover it right away. What I'm saying to you, Vincent, if we can take this tiny, we call it, I've come to realize this tiny little butterfly of covering the the climate, it will fix a lot of our climate issues that we're dealing if we cover 900 million acres. And that's not even counting the rangeland. That's right. Carbon, we would not be, we would not be talking about carbon or, or global warming. And because people don't realize 
it is that living plant that regulates the temperature on the soil surface and doesn't release all this uh, latent heat into the atmosphere. It's not just about carbon. It's about living plants. We well, got to promote that message. And I hope. And, and you had a great slide last time you presented that showed uh, that what people weren't recognizing, farmers weren't recognizing, even the government wasn't recognizing that um, showed certain times a year when all that carbon is going up into the air. Yeah. Until, yep. you know, until it yep. just happens. And, and that I think people aren't quite understanding that, you know, that carbon, it, it expires, but it also goes back into the soil if there's a house for it, you know? So the humic structures in the soil provide that home and we just want to continue it, to bring them in there. It's Vincent, it's not a poisonous gas. Without carbon, we would all be dead. There'd right. be no plants. Right. Years. That's not the issue. People are getting caught up in things that are really, we, let's cover the ground. Let's cover the ground. If we can yeah. get that. And, and once you get people to understand that, that'd be huge. I understand it. I go out in the sun today and I don't have a hat on, man. I get burned up, you know. <laughs> So Ray, thank you so crop. much. Thank you so much. Oh, we got another question? Yeah. Drake, go ahead. Hey, uh, yes. I, I kind of wanted to explain something to you and just get your thoughts on this. So yes. in Korean natural farming, we make a thing called fermented plant juice, which is just mm -hmm. uh, basically making you know kimchi, but you're getting the juice out of different plants. And so what we've been noticing is that even though we do have monocrop um, type of fields, you can take the, this plant juice from different plants and it acts as if it's the exudates of this poly crop. So if you take it from seven different plants and get the plant juice and then spray it onto this monoculture, the biology does not know that there's not seven different crops growing above it. And so it's kind of this additional tool to add to our biological sets. So I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that, you know, monoculturing with incorporating these different plant exudates from polycultures so that you can still get some of the productivity parts of monoculture, but then the biology gets the benefit of thinking there's a polyculture. Brilliant, you're brilliant. I love it because let me tell you, uh, there was a farmer, it was about five or six years ago. He was in Indiana, he was doing no-till and he was growing corn. And Ray, look at me, man, I got no-till corn and that's growing 200 bushel corn. I don't rotate, I don't do anything different. He says, man, and, and I said, you're changing the varieties every year, aren't you? And he goes, how did you know that? He goes, because I said, you must have changed something in diverse within the system because there are farmers who will grow a monoculture corn, but do different varieties of seed within that time and space and bring different genetic variety. So your, to your point, it is brilliant. Anytime you can bring diversity of microbes, gene, genes is the nature's communication, how it communicates from, from organism to organism. So I think it's brilliant. Dr. David Johnson, it's called biosignaling. That's what he calls it. We are able to wake up microbes now. They've never been able to work, wake up back to Arthur's point on transportation waking up microbes that have not been awakened. So when you do that, like that kimchi and any, like me, I'm building a Johnson Sioux bioreactor just for that reason, bringing microbes, the power of life. So I salute you for that brilliant question and what you're doing. I think it's fantastic. I, people, look, I wanna make this last statement. Growing monocultures, if it's surrounded by diversity and used with diversity, and you rotate it around, the natural system can do that. It can handle that. What it cannot handle is chronic monoculture, chronic insecticides, chronic fungicide, chronic stress. System can't handle it. It will recover from a monoculture. It's designed, it's incredibly resilient. So I salute you for bringing diversity of microbes in there. Awesome, and biosignaling. Dave, Ray, remember when uh, King Corn um, yep. When yep. They, they just ate one thing, it, it, fast food and the livers shut down on these yep. guys that yep. died for like 30 days. 
Yeah. Yeah. We we have an opportunity to help build uh, healthy soil here in Hawaii. Then yes, sir. In uh, orchards for food production, uh, whether it's uh, citrus or avocado or mango. What is a, yep. a blow and blow or roll and crimp type of mix that we might want to employ uh, in between our rows? And also we'll be you know, spraying regularly as well to keep that microbial excitement going on that you're talking about. Well, you know what? In fact, if you have, if you, is it? Can I show a slide, Vincent? Do I have a? Do I have time to show yeah, a slide? Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, because I want to show that particular situation. Let me, uh, because I tell you, uh, it's really important because, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, when I did my uh, uh, PowerPoint, it lost one of my slides and. Um, and so I'm gonna bring it up and see if I can bring my orchard up because I wanna show you what we've been doing in, in Chihuahua, Mexico, because uh, it's, it's really important because we're doing it in pecans, we're doing it in, in orchards like you're talking about. And yes, can, these, can that be done? Absolutely, and I'll show you, I'll show you a picture of it and how it, how beautiful they are under the orchard and see, uh, oh, here we go. And let me, let me hit the slide. Okay, I, I can hit, uh, it's already share slide, right? Yes. Okay, here we go, here we go. Okay, that was the slide I was missing. That was before, this is afterwards, same area. We're using the crimper roller to roll cover crops. And what I love about it is the, the, uh, the use of fertilizer for the pecans went way down, water use went down, insecticides for less problems with aphids. It was beautiful. It worked fantastic. It rolled it down, decomposed. These are all irrigated fields. It worked magnificent. This is uh, a farmer named Josh Bowman in Las Cruces, he's doing that. We're doing this on apples. We're doing this on all kinds of orchards. We're doing this on walnuts. We're doing this on pecans. We're doing this on almonds. And remember, I was taught this in the university. I was taught this. That's what I was taught. Yeah. This is what, now look at the, look at the, look at the diverse, look at the habitat for insects. So what happened? Water use went down. Nutrient uh, uh, use went down, uh, herbicides, chemicals went down. Beautiful, what? Nature self-healing, self-organizing, self-regulating. Isn't that amazing? So, yep, uh, I'll stop sharing here, but I just wanted to show you that, absolutely. Now, what, what's the mix you can use down there, up in, in down in Hawaii? Well, one thing is, um, the grasses that you see down here, it gets cold enough that we use, we use cereal rye. I think maybe a, a, a one with black oats may be one that you may be able to use because it, it tolerates more of a, of a warmer climate. You're gonna have to find some grasses guys because I don't know all the grasses down there that will do Sudan, well in Hawaii. Sudan, Sudan works that, well, Sudan grass. Sudan, Sudan rye. Um, rye, cow peas will do great down there in the mixes, right. cow peas some soybeans, put some legumes in there. But if you can get some grasses that can roll down like cereal, right? You can roll down triticale. Can you grow barley down there? Can you grow wheat down there? And Ann Emsley from our College of Tropical Agriculture said uh, uh, buffel, B-U-F-F-E-L, permanent cover in dry areas controlled by mowing. So yeah, there's, you know, there's yeah. the depth of knowledge we have here in Hawaii around yeah. all this is there. Uh, no. We just have to. We just have to get you to come here and get us to act more humble. <laughs> so, well, with that said, I Ray, would... thank you so much, brother. Good to see you, Paisan. You guys, you guys are awesome. Bye, bye. Love you guys. You guys were awesome. Thank you so much.